Uh, is there such a thing as ethical hacking? There's a question. Is it really ethical to even hack? Let's find out a bit more from our guest co-host today, uh, who of course is Mohammed Amin Bilabi, the CEO of CyberLeak, who joins us here live on the sofa. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for joining us. This has is, this is always been a phrase that has fascinated me, ethical hacking. I hear the word hacking and I think negativity straight away. It's one of those words that you just think, oh dear, he's been hacked, it's a bad thing. So what is ethical hacking? So you know, you hear always on the media negative stories around hacking yeah. and companies getting hacked, stuff and rights, but you should look at the root of the whole concept of hacking. Hacking is pretty much taking anything and uh, bring, uh, breaking it up into pieces and okay. understanding how it works and see how you can toy around with it. And that's really like the notion that hackers came up. Obviously you'll have like the two sides of a coin. Hackers are going after financial gain, criminal purposes, and that's there. We also have a lot of hackers that are reformed. You know, they said, instead of being chased by the police or looking over my shoulder all the time, let me hack these companies, show them my trade, my secrets, how I do that, and let me help them fix those holes. It's pretty much like hiring a burglar to break into your house and show you where the, you know, like the entry the points, points are. Like that, yeah. So on skills specifically, a lot of people that have the hacking expertise, right, they may not come from, or I want your opinion on this, of course, may not come from conventional backgrounds. It's something they kind of, it was a passion project, and then they said, you know, I've heard of people that have hacked the FBI, for example, um, and then actually become an agent with the FBI later because of how well they were able to spot these security leaks. Tell us about the skills that people need to get into this. In all honesty, those are the best kind of ethical hackers that you should have, like you could hire. Uh, and I'll give you a small example. Uh, in my experience, the youngest hacker that I ever worked with uh, was 12. Wow. And the gentleman started toying around with computers. That's all he had to do the whole day. Wasn't going to school, didn't have any extracurricular hobbies. So he just had that computer and access to the internet. And he realized there's such a huge world out there. So he started experimenting. And some people just have a knack for it. He was fascinated, maybe his brain is wired differently, but he just managed to find ways to break into things, taking, say, like a, an e-commerce platform where you order products. And instead of putting three or four quantity, he would put minus four, just toying around, see what would happen. And suddenly he has like a negative balance. Instead of paying money, he's getting money. So these things that generally you wouldn't think of, these hackers are just trying to push the boundaries on what a product or software or a website is built for. Um, and you have also engineers that are, you know, hackers by trade, they've gone to university. My issue with that is that they follow, they're by the book, yeah. right? It's a checklist and you go A, B, C, yes, I covered all my bases, you're good to go. But a hacker doesn't work with checklists, like they think outside of the box. And that's why they're so good and also so nefarious. So Mohammed, it sounds like it all depends on your moral standpoint as a person with hackers, hacking hackers. Um, so what made you and your team at CyberLeak start this whole thing? It's actually a funny story and it started back in 2016 in my last year of university. I just happened to meet an ethical hacker by chance. He was Moroccan. I'm Moroccan. We connected very easily. And he told me that all what he does for a living is hacking the likes of Facebook and Microsoft and LinkedIn, finding vulnerabilities and then getting payouts and rewards for that. It's called bug bounty and there's a huge industry for that. And in my mind, like if you can hack the likes of Microsoft and Facebook, surely you can hack companies in this region, large corporates. I said, yeah, sure. I gave him at that time the name of a company. I'm not going to say the name, but it took him 24 hours to access the entire database of customers, emails, purchase history, 33 million records we're talking. That took them 24 hours. And that's when I realized there is a business to it. So, I found the founders on LinkedIn, contacted them, said, hey guys, we did this for fun. We came across this issue. We would love to help you fix it. This is our rate. And that was my first contract. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought like, you know, that was an opportunity and just decided to capitalize on it. This but is deep. <laughs> it's deeper than that, that's for sure. Uh, Mo, let's talk about cybersecurity if we can, because obviously it's a clear and present concern for so many not just individuals, but major companies and corporations. It's always one of those topics that rather scares me a bit because of the scale of the problem here. I think last statistics were out recently, well, what, 69 million hacks in the UAE in this year alone so far was the, was the statistic that was rolled out. Given the scope of the problem, and we haven't got enough time to do it justice now, but what's the, what's the biggest mistake that companies are making when it comes to their cyber safety? 
Before jumping onto the question, you mentioned statistics, and I'll just give you two that might knock your sock off. <laughs> the cost of cybercrime this year alone amounted to almost $10 trillion. Trillion. Trillion dollars in T, right? Between direct and indirect losses. Wow. And every 11 seconds, a company falls victim to ransomware attack. That's mind blowing. Uh, and generally, most of the time, the issue is not about companies not having enough cybersecurity precautions in place or softwares in place. It's not generally a technology problem. In my experience, it's a human problem. They're the weakest chain, uh, link in the chain. And it's generally your employee who's, you know, like opening those like phishing emails from that Nigerian prince. I mean, they're more so sophisticated these days. Um, or it's someone opening pages they shouldn't or uh, downloading things they shouldn't, right? And that exposes the entire company. You could put a million fence in place, but if the employee leaves the door open, it's pointless, right? Interesting. So I um, was in the corporate sector for a while between HR and IT, and I was targeted as well. So I got an email that came from the name of my bank and it said HR department, you know? Now at the time, I was working in the HR department, so I could easily spot that this wasn't, but they had sent a number of those emails to our employees as well, with details of their compensation. So of course, everyone would just go click and open it, right? So they're getting so sophisticated in terms of like the, 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 um, the websites that they use and the, the at, you know, it matches exactly the company name. So how can companies actually protect themselves a little bit more from this? Because it's coming into internal security networks, you know, and the organization I worked for was very highly secure because it was under a semi-government entity. Um, so what can the government, but also these um, organizations do to protect themselves? That's a great point. And you mentioned how sophisticated they're getting these phishing emails. Now, if you think an email with the logo of your bank is convincing enough, look at what's happening today with people cloning voices of CEOs and CFOs yeah. and sending calls or like, you know, voice messages. You're receiving a message from your boss. He's on the phone. He's telling you to wire the money. Now, how many people would actually second guess that, right? And this was becoming popular with all these deep fakes. Uh, now, what can governments and corporates do? Uh, honestly, the basics are always the most important to cover. So employee training, having some sort of multi-factor authentication in right. place, uh, making sure that you have some sort of email filtering in place because a lot of the efficient emails can be spotted somehow. But it all boils down to having a good sense of just realizing that something's fishy, right? Yeah. Something's wrong. If it's too good to be true, or if it's out of uh, abnormal to have that sort of instruction from your boss or your colleague, then chances are it might be, you know, like nefarious. So double check with your IT department, with the right person, give them a call. So you have two ways of checking. It's not only the email, but also you get their confirmation by phone number. Those pesky humans, they're just making too many, <laughs> you know. This is what it is. Roll on, roll on. You said they're the weekly. Right. Bring artificial on the robots, come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mohammed, you can't go anywhere because we have so much to learn from you so that we don't get hacked. But coming up next, we'll be finding out about a community of parents and educators that are on a mission to give every child in the UAE a brighter, smartphone-free childhood. Stay with us.